In this video, we'll look at the design of this microcontroller-based system on module in a small M2 form factor. This system on module contains a default set of components, such as a powerful STM32F4 microcontroller, SDRAM, USB-I flash, clocks, and programming interface. The system on module can then easily connect via a card edge socket to a suitable carrier board, with a flexible pinout that is useful for many different carrier board designs, useful for many different projects, and so on. This then eliminates the need to redesign the same MCU-based system for every new project, saving cost, reducing waste, and reducing bring-up, for example. We'll look at why we may want to design a system like this, and what we need to consider within the design, as well as looking at a walkthrough of the schematic and PCB design using small footprint BGA components. This little brain system on module will be used in future videos as a generic programmable system useful for many different projects such as audio processing, switching converter controllers and more. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. I designed this little brain system on module using Altium Designer and will do a design walkthrough in this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. Check out all the cool new Altium 365 features as well as to get 25% off your first license purchase. I also have a new course out called the Advanced Digital Hardware Design Course and this goes into great detail on how to design your own advanced hardware featuring FPGAs, system on chips, high speed DDR memory and high speed peripherals such as gigabit ethernet, USB high speed and so on. There's about 11 and a half hours of content in this course going through everything you need to know to design your advanced systems. I'll leave a link to this in the description below so you can check out the course content and how to sign up for this course. For all of these YouTube videos, I typically make different PCBs which serve different functions. For example, a previous little brain might have had various sensors on it, SD cards, USB and so on. I might make a microcontroller based digital guitar effects processing system or Wi-Fi capable systems or other DSP based systems. What they have in common is that they typically have a microcontroller, some external memory, USB connections, programming headers and so on. The problem with this is that for every video and for every design, I always have to do the layout and routing of a microcontroller. I have to pay for the part, I have to pay for all of these decoupling capacitors, all of these connectors, and then I can maybe use it for one or two videos or one or two designs that I'm playing around with at the moment in my spare time. I know I should have done this probably a lot earlier ago, but then I decided for this video and for future videos, I created my own system on module. If you look for system on module on a typical search engine, you'll see a few different examples. They are typically centered around some sort of main IC. This could be an FPGA, system on chip, microcontroller, have external memory on board, the various power supplies and so on. But then on the other side of one of these system on modules will typically have connectors or will have these sort of card edge connectors. The system on module is fairly useless on its own, but typically plugs into what's known as a carrier or motherboard. Therefore, all of the hard work is pretty much already done on the system on module. We've fanned out, for example, our BGA packages. We've connected up our memories. And then we just have to design a carrier board every time we want a different function. And this is exactly what I've done with this little brain system on module. And I'll show you how I did this in this video. I've added a microcontroller, some external memories, a programming header, crystal oscillators, all the decoupling capacitors, and then I only need to do this once and I get a couple of these boards produced and I can plug them in and design, for example, simple carrier boards. We'll see this board in a future video, but then all I need to do is create a carrier board which supports my system on module and I fan out from my system on module and have various predefined connections. My system on module then simply plugs in and I don't have to do the fairly tedious job of laying out and routing a BGA packages and memory and so on. This is all done before. And this is why I really like system on modules and finally decided to make one for the YouTube videos. I created this little brain system on module using an M2 form factor. M2 form factors you might be familiar with, for example, with fairly modern SSDs, such as this one here. It's a very small form factor, often around 22 by 80 millimeters, where we have a PCB populated with various components. On the right hand side, we have what's known as an edge connector, effectively exposed pads that can plug into a socket. On the left hand side, we have a location for a mounting mechanism, for example, for a screw and then a screw hole. 
This board, or this SSD in this case, will then be connected and plugged in and screwed down on a motherboard or a carrier board. So the right hand side will be, for example, connected to one of these standardized connectors and will slot in. And on the other side, we will screw this down with a suitable mounting hole on a carrier board, for example, such as shown in this image. As you already see from this image, compared to the typical human hand, these boards are very, very small and a very nice compact form factor. The nice thing is the M2 interface is standardized. This is both from, for example, the outline or the dimensions. So we can have various form factors, 22 millimeters by 30, 22 by 60, 22 by 80, and so on. So at least the, the dimensions are fairly compact and they're standardized. This also standardizes the position of the mounting hole, for example, but also the card edge connector type. For example, looking at the edge connector end on the bottom side where we have these exposed pads, we can see we have various different notches in different positions. These are what's known as in the M2 world as keys. So we have key E, we have key A, we have key Bs and Ms and so on. I'll leave this web page in the description below this video for you to read through in your own time. We have different notches and also different number of contacts left and right of those notches. And these are, of course, standardized to various systems. For example, key B might support SATA, key M might support different flavors of PCI Express, and key E might have PCI Express and USB. And all of these pins, typically around 70-ish pins, will have different functions. So this would be power, ground, PCI Express, USB, GPIO, and so on. So these are very much standardized interfaces. The nice thing is then any SSD manufacturer, for example, can use these standardized interfaces and pinouts, and these will be compatible then with the motherboard to use. What I did for this design then is base everything on an M2 form factor. In this case, I actually went with this middle one here. So a 22 by 42 millimeter form factor, which is very nice and compact, but I did rather misuse this M2 system. I did stick with a form factor and I did stick with a certain type of key because I need to be able to fit it into one of these standardized connectors. But other than that, I freely chose my pinout as we'll see. So I'm not following the M2 standard other than the dimensions and the actual keying, but the pinout I then chose myself. Again, we'll see this later how I did that. The reason I did this for the system or module is because these connectors are then so cheap to put on a carrier board. You can see a connect is about one to two euros in low quantities. And I really like the form factor and the tiny size of these boards. Again, the nice thing about system on modules is that we don't have to do the usual decoupling fan out of BGAs and memory components and so on. So we reduce our time and we have a proven system that works. Additionally, we've had the, or we are still in the chip shortage at the time of making this video. So a lot of times when you design something with an IC that might be out of stock, for example, as we see here, and these ICs are also fairly costly. This means creating your own system on modules. Once they're working, they reduce your cost, they reduce waste for upcoming projects, and they really simplify future designs as you only have to design the carrier boards. It also simplifies the software. If we use the same ICs, same RAM connections and memory connections, we can use the same effectively boilerplate code before we start a new project. The Little Brain F4 M2 module we saw at the beginning of this video has these main components on it. So this is the block diagram of the system. I chose a fairly powerful STM32 F4 microcontroller, and I'll show you how to set that up in just a second. And connected to that are the essential components that we will need for many future designs. I want to make my system on module as generic as I can, but still useful. Meaning we have the centerpiece, which is a microcontroller. Connected to that are 32 megabytes of SD RAM. We also have one megabyte of flash in the form of a QSBI non-volatile flash module. We have the typical external crystals, for example, a high-speed external, as well as a low-speed external LSE, which can feed, for example, my real-time clock. As you can see, there's a very generic components, but components will need pretty much in any case. I've also added a programming interface, of course, but the rest is then fed on to an M2 key B connector, which we saw previously. All that is then connected to this M2B connector is power and various grounds, as well as then a general pinout from the microcontroller. So this is very, very generic and not project specific. I've connected up USB, for example, I2S or serial audio interface, various UARTs, SPIs, I2Cs, various ADC channels, timers, and CAN buses, and so on. This is really nice because for then any future project, I can either reconfigure the microcontroller on the various IO pins to fit the needs of that project. Say I need 10 ADC channels in USB in one project, and I need five I2Cs in a different project. This is possible with such a system on module. 
The nice thing about the M2 edge connector is, is that the power, the 3.3 volts that feeds the system on module actually comes from the carrier or motherboard. So therefore the 3.3 volts is fed from the M2 key B connector to the various components on the little brain module, as we'll see. Again, just a brief run through, I have this STM32 F4 microcontroller, which is fairly powerful, runs up to 180 megahertz, has loads of cool features, quite a large IO count, and the particular package I chose is a BGA package, and we'll see how to find that out in just a second. I also chose some volatile memory, some external RAM, and this is a 32 megabyte module, again also a BGA package. I also added some non-volatile flash, QSPI flash memory, just to provide some method, for example, for data logging or for storing firmware on this device. And this is this WinBond part and one megabyte of that. Let's go through the schematic first before we look at the PCB design. As we saw from the block diagram, this particular system on module is actually fairly straightforward. All we have is a microcontroller, an STM32 F4 type and a BGA package. We have one megabyte of QSPI flash, some SD RAM, the M2 key B edge connector pinout itself, and of course some form of programming interface where I'm using a tag connect header as we'll see later. The centerpiece of this design is the STM32 F4 microcontroller. This is in a BGA package. It's a pretty powerful microcontroller, up to 180 megahertz, various peripherals including USB, ADCs and so on. The first question I ask myself is what pinout do I want and what peripherals do I want for this particular system on module? The system on module itself should try and be as generic as possible meaning I want to expose quite a lot of the interfaces and as many pins as I can routed to my M2 key B edge connector. However, there were some constraints of interfaces I would like. First of all, we need to use a lot of the pinout of this BGA package to route, for example, to the SD RAM. As you can see, there's quite a few connections here, as well as the QSPI flash, the program interface, various crystals and so on. This pinout is the pinout I then started with, because this is typically, at least these types of microcontrollers, fairly fixed. To get the pinout, you can either use your preferred microcontroller's datasheet, but for the STM32 environment, I like to use STM32 Cube IDE, which is a free program you can download. In STM32 Cube IDE, they've got this nice pinout and configuration editor. So for this particular STM32 F4 BGA package microcontroller, this is the pinout I then ended up with. What I had to do firstly is the system core, enable my serial wire debug connections, so my programming connections. I had to enable my high speed external oscillator and my low speed external oscillator for timing. But then of course, importantly, also my SD RAM connections. My SD RAM connections, I needed to use the flexible memory controller or FMC for short. And this has a few different memory interface types. I went with SD RAM with a certain number of address and data bits, depending on the memory model I chose. Also, as you can see on the left hand side, there's a quad SPI interface, which I selected, and this is a pretty much fixed pinout for the most part. You can also alter the pinout, as we'll see also with the layout and routing stage, as microcontrollers and also then FPGAs are of course rather flexible. So by control clicking on a specific pin assignment, you can see there's a flashing pin elsewhere where I could maybe move this pin too. And this makes your layout and routing life a lot easier, being able to move these pins around. But in essence, this is then how I came up with the various FMC or these SD RAM connections, as well as the QSPI memory connections. For the SD RAM, I have all of my address command and control signals, which are color coded blue, and I've added a net class so I can delay match these nets later on when we come to PCB layout and routing. This is a 16 bit wide data bus. So I have two single byte byte lanes or byte groups. So I have byte lane one and byte lane zero, which are routed separately, so to speak, from my address command and control. Again, I'm providing net classes so I can match delays. The pinout for this is very straightforward. They are effectively just point to point connections. I'm not using any termination because this is actually fairly slow. It turns out looking at the data sheet for the STM32 F4 microcontroller, the actual FMC clock, the SD RAM clock can only go up to 90 megahertz. So we can be pretty relaxed with our termination and also our delay matching as we'll see later on. What I do like to do, however, is for clocks to provide some series termination. So you can see these 22 ohm resistors, anytime you see them, they'll typically, for these fairly low speed designs, only be on clock signals. The resistor itself, as we'll see later, is then placed very close to the output driver. For example, for the QSPI clock, I place this very close to pin J5. For the FMC SD RAM clock, I place it close to pin G11. So these are the only series resistors and these not very high speed designs that I would place. 
But other than that, I simply get my pin out from Cube IDE or the datasheet and do a point to point connection for the SDRAM. Very similarly for the QSPI flash, again, point to point connections, just a series termination resistor on the clock. The other pinout is then fairly flexible. You can see I've got various ADCs, I've got USB on the go, I2C, SPIs, SAIs, and so on. And this I chose based on my preferences and what interfaces I will typically need in the projects I make for the YouTube channel. I need a lot of ADC channels. This can be used for current sensing, voltage sensing, sensing and control settings, and so on. So I wanted quite a lot of those. I typically use USB, for example, for data logging. So I definitely needed that. I'd like to make some videos using CAN, so I enabled that. Timer channels for PWM or for reading encoders. UARTs are always helpful and so on. I wanted to, of course, make it as generic as possible, but there were some interfaces that I definitely wanted exposed. Again, for this, I played around with the pinout using Cube IDE, making sure everything fits in my design, seeing where I can move pins together, which then aid my layout and routing, as we'll see later on. You will also have seen that I have two crystal oscillators. One is X2 on the right hand side, which is simply a 25 megahertz external oscillator, which goes to these fixed pins D1 and E1. I also have a low speed external oscillator, which is used for the RTC, the real time clock of this STM32 F4 microcontroller. Again, attaching these peripherals to make this board as generic as I can make it with all of the essential peripherals. Of course, we need to power this microcontroller, and for this, we have the power section of this schematic symbol. Typically, unless otherwise stated, I use one 100 nanofarad or a small decoupling capacitor per power pin. I have also added some bulk decoupling capacitance and some filtering for the VDDA rail, which is used for the analog part of this design, for example, for the ADCs. And this is just following typical data sheets, application notes, and so on. The nice thing is once I've done this once and I've laid out and rooted this, of course, for subsequent projects, I don't need to think about all these decoupling placements and how to do this, reading data sheets and so on. I want to have a finished working module. I just plug this into my carrier board and worry about the carrier board design. We also have serial wire debug connections on the top right hand side, which come from the microcontroller, which route to a tag connect header we'll see later on. This is my main programming interface and I decided to put this directly on the board, but also route the signals out if I want to the M2 connector as we'll see later on. The QSPI flash and SDRAM connections we saw before, decoupling wise again, one decoupling capacitor per power pin. Finally then, I have my M2 key B edge connector pin out. And this is where I have my power input. So my 3.3 volts is fed from my carry board or from my motherboard through the connector into the system on module and feeds all of these parts. So my microcontroller runs off 3.3, my flash, my SDRAM, they all run off 3.3 volts. So I don't need a separate power supply or for example, a buck or an LDL converter on the design. I'm getting that through this edge connector. The rest is then the serial wire debug connections as well as the IO, my interfaces I chose coming from my microcontroller. You can see there's also no ESD protection or the like on there because that then needs to be placed on the carrier board close to the interfaces and the connectors. Of course, given that this is a fairly flexible microcontroller, if I, for example, assigned an ADC channel, it doesn't mean later on when I'm designing the carrier board that this needs to stay an ADC channel if I don't need it. For example, clicking on one of these pins, you can see the ADC channel can also be a timer channel, it could be a UART transmit or simple GPIO. Just because I've written a specific function on the pin out doesn't mean these pins can't change, which is also a very nice feature in case you need it. So therefore, I also chose pins that I routed out to the M2 connector, which are very flexible. So any of these ADC channels will have loads of different alternate functions that I can use depending on what carrier board I'm designing. So as you can see, a very, very simple design, but contains all of the essentials that I might need for any future projects. Now let's go through the PCB design aspects of this little brain system on module. Keep in mind that this system module is rather compact and opening PCBs in a PCB design editor or your ECAD tool can often be rather deceiving as things look rather large. In any case, we have about 22 millimeters in width and about 42 millimeters in length. So rather space constrained. That's why I also went with these BGA or these QFN packages to give myself more layout and routing room. The board thickness itself has to be 0.8 millimeters to fit in the card edge connectors we saw earlier in this video. And this might impose some constraints on how many layers you can use and also might increase your manufacturing cost. The board dimensions we can get from the M2 standard, as well as the placement of all of these card edge connector pads 
and exposed pads we need, which we then plug into the cart edge connector, so top and bottom. We will of course also need the key we want to use, so if there's key E, A, B or M, and I've created a generic footprint for this. From the footprint I created in my footprint library, I can then place this and define the board outline using this. So we have our card edge connect on one side, a key B, and a semicircular hole on the top hand side, which we can then screw down onto our carrier board. Most components are on the top hand side, however, on the bottom side, we need to place a variety of decoupling capacitors, for example, due to us using BJ packages. The centerpiece is the BJ package at the bottom here, which is our STM32 F4 microcontroller. The reason for placing it here is that it should be close to the card edge connector pins, as most of our I.O. is routed down to these pins. Above that and fairly close, we have the SDRAM, which should be fairly close and aligned, as we'll see in a second, with the SDRAM pins on the microcontroller itself. The QSPI flash is the top right QFN package. We have the high speed external crystal, as well as the low speed external crystal, placed not optimally, but we had to place this due to these spacing constraints and the way the pinout is of this SDM32 F4 microcontroller. But we still would like to place these parts far enough away from high speed IO and so on. On the top right hand side, you will have probably already spotted this tag connect serial wire debug header, and this is my preferred method of debugging and programming these STM32 F4 microcontrollers. I'll leave a link to these in the description below, but these are connectors and cables you can use that just have these pogo pin pads, as we saw in the design. The connector then simply clips onto these pads and connects to our, for example, ST Link debug probe on the other side, which connects to our computer. The main challenges of this board are the size itself and then also fanning out these various BGA packages. For this, I used a six layer board at 0.8 millimeter thickness. Going through the layers, we of course have our top layer with the most of our components. Directly underneath, we have a solid ground plane. And this is what I strongly recommend to have a ground plane adjacent to any signal or power plane. The third layer is then our power delivery layer, where this red polygon is our 3.3 volts, which we get from our card edge connector from the carrier board. Again, this is adjacent to a ground plane. Layer four is the only internal signal layer we're using, which is predominantly for the SD RAM connections, as we'll see in a second. Then layer five, again, a solid ground plane, which layer four can reference, as well as layer six, the bottom layer can reference which contains a few passive components, decoupling capacitors, some series resistors, as well as a lot of I.O. routing. At the start of this design, I started, of course, with a board outline, seeing what spaces I have, and then playing out with a layout of where I place, for example, my microcontroller, my SD RAM, QSPI memory, and so on. When it comes to BGA fan out, luckily the BGAs in this design are 0.8 millimeter pitch. Pitch meaning the spacing between the pads or the lands of this BGA package. This means we can still use standard technologies, we don't have to go to HDI or anything. The way I would typically do or start a fan out of a BGA package, we have these various outer pads, which are fairly easy to root out. All we have to do is go from our land and root out with a fairly thin trace to wherever it needs to go. So the outer rows and columns are pretty easy to do. The next row or column, for example, the second set of pads, we can again root a thin trace out between these various pads or lands. Keep in mind the trace has to be rather thin. I'm using a 0.1 millimeter trace to make sure I have clearance between the trace and the lands. So I have 0.13 millimeter clearance. I could make the traces slightly wider. It depends on what your manufacturer capabilities are. But this is quite straightforward, just rooting out from these BGAs from the first and second rows and columns. Once you've done this and you need to work on the inner layers and the inner columns and rows, you'll need to start fanning these out with vias to go to inner layers and then continue your routing like so. What I typically recommend just as a starting point is what's known as dog bone fan out. And you can see the structure here. We have a pad, we have a short trace, and then a via placed central to a group of four of these pads. I can then simply place one of these and wherever I need it, I can place this structure again and again. And this is then how I would do my inner layer fan out. So I'll do this dog bone shape, and then on an inner layer, or for example, the bottom layer, I would route to wherever I need to go and then route up again on the top or bottom layer, depending on where you need to go. The same thing I would do for power and power and ground are typically centered within the BJ package as we have for this STM32 F4 microcontroller. In this case, I wouldn't use a thin trace. I would use a trace as wide as the pad, route out at a 45 degree angle, place a via to my internal ground or power layers. You can see I've sometimes consolidated power and ground pads 
for example, H5 and H6 share the same via. And for these designs, that's perfectly fine. I needed to do this as for the inner layers, I need to route past this C of vias and holes. So only by consolidating power and ground vias, I can route this out without using more expensive technology, for example. My power and ground pads come in pairs. So therefore I, for example, route H5 out to this via and G5 out to this power via. On the bottom hand side, I can then simply place my decoupling capacitor very close to this power and ground pair with short white traces going directly into these vias. And this way, then I place all my decoupling capacitors on the bottom side using these connections. So power and ground vias come as pairs, decoupling capacitors close with short white traces. And these are fairly small decoupling capacitors such as 0201 or 0402 parts to be able to fit through these through vias. With the via placement, it's also important as these vias will perforate these ground and power planes that we space these vias and holes far enough apart so we can still get copper pull slivers through these vias and we don't get too large of cutouts in our PCB design and in our ground planes. BGA fan out and routing is an iterative process and depending on how much you need to fan out will also determine your layer count. For this, six layers were enough because I moved my pin out of my mic controller around such that I can route a lot of these pins out from the outer two rows and columns, meaning I don't need to dig down very much with all of these vias. However, some of the pin out was of course constrained and I couldn't move it around. For example, the SD RAM routing were using a lot of the inner rows and columns of the BGA, which means I had to dig down using my dog bone fan out and then route through to my SD RAM module at the top. The SD RAM module itself is also a 0.8 millimeter pitch BGA, but much less dense. So we have this inner channel, which is pretty free with these power and ground pin and pad pairs. We do the same decoupling strategies as before and the same dog bone fan out. Again, it's an iterative process, but keep in mind to place all of your vias first before you start your routing. Place all of these little shapes and pads first and your vias first because placing a via after you've routed a large section will be very, very difficult. I've then approximately delay matched the address command control as well as all of these byte lane signals to within about 100 picoseconds. This is even overkill. You can be fairly relaxed with this SDRAM delay tuning. If you'd like to go into far more detail on the SDRAM hardware and firmware for STM32 microcontrollers, make sure to check out video number 80 on my channel. But in essence, there's not too much to this other than doing the fan out of the BGA, placing all of your vias first and needing to use fairly small feature sizes, such as these traces, but also the vias need to be able to fit with sufficient clearance between these BGA pads. So the actual via size themselves are 0.4 millimeter pad and 0.15 millimeter drill, which is rather small, but is needed to fit underneath these BGAs. Other than that, I've placed my QSPI flash to the right of the SDRAM module and the majority of that routing starts again from my BGA package. I'm doing my usual fan out with my dog bone shapes, routing on layer six. As you can see here, the series, for example, the clock routes out, bottom layer immediately into my series termination resistor and all my QSPI routing is then done on the bottom layer, comes up into this QFN package. Decoupling capacitors close, trying to maintain space between traces and so on. Because I'm also changing reference layers, for example, layer one has reference layer two and layer six has reference layer five and layer four has reference layer five. Anytime I do a signal via transition, for example, this QSPI or IO2 via, I place what's known as a transfer via, so a grounded via very close. So I have a controlled reference path when I'm doing my Z axis transition. So when I'm going from layer one to layer six, this ground via acts as a reference or return path. My crystals are tried to place away from high speed or higher speed signals, trying to maintain spacing and giving myself enough clearance. Other than that, all I had to do was then of course feed my IO from the STM32 microcontroller into my edge connector at the bottom side. The pinout here is not following any M2 standard. I did this pinout based on how my routing was. So because I routed out my, for example, these ADC channels like so on the top layer, all I then did was assign the pads of my M2 edge connector, depending on how it fit my layout and routing best. What you can also see is that I have a lot of ground returns. So adjacent to every single signal, I have one ground return. And this is what I'd highly recommend to maintain a proper return path for EMI and SI reasons. This is true also for the bottom layer. I did all of this fan out, routing down to my edge connector and did the pin out based on how my layout and routing was easiest. 
also placing grounds next to each signal and power. My power input is then also at the edge connector and I'm using two pads to reduce inductance and improve my current handing capabilities. They route straight into these bulk bypass capacitors, which then feed the internal power and ground planes as my power input. Lastly, the last routing part is of course the serial wire debug connections, and these start, for example, pad A11, A12, again routing out to a via, transfer via as a ground here, and I'm using layer four predominantly to route up to my tag connect header through the pads of these resistors into this tag connect header. You might have already spotted on the schematic that I have these series resistors R9 to R11, which can be placed if we want to route this onto the M2 edge connector. If we just want to use the onboard tag connect header, I can get rid of R9 to R11 or do not place these parts, which means I don't have very long stubs coming off these serial wire debug lines. If I want to route out to the M2 edge connector, for example, if I want to use an offboard programmer or different type of header, I place these resistors. So I first will route up and then I place these resistors at the other side of these resistors, so to speak. I can then route back down to my M2 edge connector. In this way, by then placing or not placing resistors, I can eliminate these long stubs that are attached to these data lines. So that's a nice little technique I sometimes employ when I need to. That being said, I hope this gave you a good initial overview of this PCB design, as we'll be using this PCB in future videos where we need a generic microcontroller, some flash memory or some RAM, and we don't want to keep redesigning the same system over and over again. For example, in a future video, we saw this previously, I designed this buck converter control PCB that uses this little brain module where we can do digital feedback control of our own buck converter. And I think that's quite an interesting project that we'll look at in a future video. In this way, I just have to place down a card edge connector. I can plug my little brain in. On the other side, I have a mounting hole, which I can screw down this board, maybe with a standoff. And then I simply do my pin out from this card edge connector to whatever carrier board I'm designing. So the schematic for this, I would simply have my M2 key B socket, and I've taken the pin out from my little brain schematic and only need to use certain sections that are used in this particular carrier board. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it is useful and I hope it gave you some inspiration to maybe create your own system on module, maybe even in an M2 form factor. This video was meant as an introduction to this particular little brain M2 keyboard as we'll be seeing this in future videos and I'll reference back to this video. If you like the video, please leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with any new video releases. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.